we won the north london derby at at the tottenham state stadium so i think we spoke about this after aston villa port nira remember and we were like all we need is just win the rest of our games and we'll see because before the run in if you had given yeah. me yeah if before the run in if you have given me one loss out of aston villa tottenham and united i would have taken it so i think today's win alleviates a lot of my worries and pains and everything from the season then we'll see what happens one of the enigmas for arsenal's midfield is thomas partey i know neither of you are a big fan of thomas partey but it's one of those things like he gives us such a like he just adds a new dimension going forward with his you know uh quick passes distribution on the wings like saka comes into play really quickly when he's playing but also we become a little bit more vulnerable on on the transition uh, do you think that that's right do you think he's ba- he's getting back to his best i mean back to his best is a little bit of a stretch because uh, there were a couple of moments actually a lot of moments where i thought that transition he he didn't have the legs to reach yeah. certain places and he's kind of like jorginho right now where the act like his a- athleticism is not that much he's not that crazy of an athlete as he used to be before he was a very press resistant player almost like 2 years ago but as of now he's not as press resistant as he used to be but again he gives us so many other things in play that other players don't there are so many yeah. things that we can take out of thomas partey that jorginho can't uh, do that so so yeah overall i'm really happy that he's back because we need that but it's not to say that we cannot upgrade next season we definitely can upgrade on parthi with a player who has similar kind of um, um you know similar kind of features a similar kind of uh, good things like parthi does but yeah. happy to have him back in the business end of the season because i know yeah. in about like one month he's going to break down so <laughs> we have a good one yeah. um, i think we are very lucky to have we are lucky to experience parthi's one last arsenal down. Uh, yeah. So the reason, <laughs> just just one. So the reason you want to kind of have a replacement for Partey is because he's more injury prone. Is that the main reason? Yeah, I think that is the only reason. I think he's yeah. one of. The, I mean, only... not not even just that. It's more the fact that um, he's injury prone and he's at the like he's at an age right now where we can't expect him to get better and better. And the only thing okay. we can expect is him mm-hmm. to maintain his. form yeah. but you know next season is next season that is you never know if he's going to be good or not and this he just has one year, one more year on his contract and this might oh, be yeah. a perfect opportunity mm-hmm. to actually sell him yeah. and upgrade on him because you know saudi clubs are there there are a lot of things that he can do he can go to and we can maybe recuperate some amount of money he's also yeah, on yeah. really high wage so for sure but nandra he's given us a good push like for these last yeah, two yeah, games yeah. he's mm-hmm. been enormous and I we think, have to start into the rest three as well i think if you look at us uh, party and rice and you could clearly see the differentiators between the two in their gameplay right declan rice great interceptor he would tackle he would run with the ball he would carry the ball he can make the passes but those long verticals and just the transition element that party causes with his play i think that's very unique to him within this arsenal squad so he adds a lot to the arsenal game i mean we can only hope and and you know just imagine what arsenal's campaign would have been if he was available for at least 50% of of the games that we had played until he was available so definitely a big one but moving on to another player who scored 18 ga supposedly the flop of the season as per <laughs> agents in the athletic and uh, the worst business that's ever done in the history of football i mean surely that's not true right and nobody um, wants to defend him i think avinav avinav won't defend him because obviously rival player but need of come on habits how is how is he done i'm going to talk about this i'm trying to solve some technical issues you guys okay. go and talk so Abhinav, would you have Havertz over Nunez? I pro- I'm even thinking of having Chris Woods over Nunez at this point. <laughs> I don't like. I mean, I don't know, man. I think Nunez is a separate topic altogether. But coming to yeah. Havertz, and I think I think he's been he's been very good. He comes up with these clutch goals against important teams, and I think that's one thing which is lacking not just with Nunez, with a, with a lot of our forwards, like with Diaz or with even I think Jota is the only one who kind of comes up. Even Salah has kind of fallen off a cliff in the last couple of months or so. Yeah. But these clutch goals and these important goals and everything, that's something which Havertz has been kind of that that one. one game where we debated a lot about this whether he kind of dived or not and then he scored the winner again i think it was bonny mata oh yeah Against Arsenal against Arsenal and then against in Chelsea he almost had a hat trick and now right now against Spurs I mean you can't get more import enter goals than that so I think yeah. I think it's it's been a hallmark it's it's very telling that a player who's been in a functional team dysfunctional setup comes here and then has a specific role to play for and the coach kind of knows how to use him how much kind of changed can that bring right so yeah, yeah. that's that's an example of perfect coaching and perfect use of your resources I think before 
before we move on to Nirav and let him speak on Havertz, I just want to say on that Arsenal or Arteta having that, you know, saving bone in him. Mm. The next player I want to be saved is Marcus Rashford. Just by the way, yeah. I like. I no, really take would... Nicholas Jackson. Rashford is fine. Rashford will come. Take Jackson. No, thank Both you. Them there. We'll come to Jackson, but I would take Rashford right now. Okay, need go ahead. I would. So much has to be defended here. I was just waiting <laughs> for this. Firstly, like, we are we clear on the fact that Havertz is a striker for Arsenal? Yes, we're yeah. clear on that point, for sure. We're clear on the fact that he's um he's really good aerially and he can give us scoring a lot of headers. Are we really clear with the fact that his work rate is insane, immense? All ninety minutes just running. He we really clear with the fact that he defends really well. When like when yeah. you know when we they need one goal or something like that, he's a really good presence in the box to um you know, basically give us that aerial defense. So what, there is no, absolutely no issue in Havertz as a striker. He's probably yeah. not crazy kin- clinical, but for 60 million guys, come on. This is, this is a world where Chris Wood went for 40 million. So, Did he? You know, oh wow, I forgot about that. I think so. I think Wood, uh, <laughs> when Newcastle bought him, he went for 40 million for sure. Oh my uh, God. From Burnley, maybe, maybe not. Maybe I'm absolutely horribly <laughs> wrong here. Maybe oh, whatever. We've seen worse players for that much. I mean, Laka yeah. said went for 50. What did he give us? Like the last four years, Havertz is giving yeah. more this season. This is, he'll probably break Laka at tally if he scores two, three more goals. He's already had 30. <laughs> 15 plus goals for a striker who, is, who played at number eight for most of the season is actually yeah. enormous. It's actually really, really good. And that to clutch goals. I would yeah. even go as far to say that Kai Havertz could possibly be the signing of the season and possibly sure. our player of the year as well. I mean, if yeah. like it's going to be probably going to be Odegaard or Declan Rice. It's a tough fight there. A lot of good yeah. players. Kai Havertz is up there and no one could have thought that he would even have a shout here. He's given us yeah. so much in these tough games. He's given us so much in big games. And at this point, it looks like a, honestly like a smart and a very shrewd signing. Very shrewd signing. Yeah. I think that I had one, one criticism of him. I have one mm-hmm. criticism of him about his passing. But today is long ball to Saka. I mean, that was world class. The ball. Obviously, Saka's control and, and the finish, everything obviously added to the fact that it was a great ball. But it was a perfectly timed ball and he, he crossed it and it was a goal, which was basically the differentiator. So, I completely agree. He's definitely one of the up there among the signing of the seasons. And the best <laughs> part about Havertz is that he gets on with everything. He has no disciplinary issue. He has no separate ego or something. He seems like a nice nice guy who just wants to come play gives it all for the team we've yeah. heard Jorginho also say that like he's one of the most hardworking people we've had Ramsdale dad I mean I'm just giving you small examples of people praising Kai Havertz who actually hates Arsenal right now because Ramsdale is nowhere and no one even cares about him anymore but he's um, uh, he's also come out and praised his work rate and how he, he's so involved within the club and he's getting so much love there so they, these things are pretty good and he scored two goals against Chelsea that's even if he would have scored zero goals and just turned up on the <laughs> Chelsea game, I would have been fine. I would have been like, okay, what? And the celebration. Yes, yes. Come on. Let's the go. Celebration. <laughs> scored against our two rivals in two games back to back. He scored against City. Everything. He's done everything, everything that we can ask him to do. Only thing left is to score a banger header at Old Trafford. And I think it'll be complete. So let's yeah. end this on that happy note and move on to our rivals because I don't want to jinx it any further. Yeah, I want to, before, <laughs> let's just talk like, a little bit about Raya because we were just talking about yeah. new signings. Yeah. Um, Havertz was a new signing. Timber was the other signing. Declan Rice was a signing. Declan Rice definitely a hit. Yeah. Havertz definitely a hit. Timber hasn't shown up, so it's jury still out. Raya, on the other hand, a hundred percent, I would say, hit because of the reason that he gives us so much calmness. Now you'd think that this is such a funny statement coming today because of what he did. <laughs> No, um, no, no, no. But he gives us so much more calmness than Ramsdale. He gives us so much aerial presence. He's so much more of like a... For one bad thing that he does, he does so many good things. And I feel like the yeah. job of a goalkeeper in a possession-based team is probably one of the hardest. And that to a title season goalkeeper. He might have to make 20 decisions, 20 tough pass in that situation to evade Tottenham's press. He did 19 of those perfectly. One place he slips up, done. If a striker yeah. slips up one time, you don't remember. When the goalkeeper slips up one time... You're going to concede a goal and it's all done. So yeah, that's yeah. that's aside, I don't think there's any criticism of him today. Right after his mistake, he went on. He caught all of Tottenham's crosses. His presence is so good there. And Tottenham literally played into his hands. He just went there. He caught it. He caught it. His yeah. hand span is so big. The way he just he commands that. His balance is so big. Like he can just, he's, he's yeah. like a cat in the air. Like he, yeah. 
catches the ball and then he's he just does land properly there's no awkward landing he controls the ball yeah. he keeps it close yeah i agree i think and to be honest if i were to rank him in the premier league alisson is clear top right alisson is great with everything but he's mm. close third or close third to edison in my opinion not in terms of shot stopping maybe not but everything else that things that he brings to the table i think he's he's close third the last year edison. raya was like foot mob like highest rated goalkeeper even for saves and all he was right up there for brentford mm-hmm. this year he is going to win the golden glove undoubtedly but that's not all on him it's also on saliba yeah. and gabriel yeah. generally on the big fans but just seeing vicario today the comparisons <laughs> are so clear right like vicario is yeah. amazing shot stopper i get it but th- just doesn't command the penalty box at all and he was yeah. probably in the team of the season in the first few weeks so that's why i, I mean even in combined at- 11s you would see like especially it's funny you would see 3 out of five or four out of five defenders including the goalkeeper being Tottenham players and I was like what is happening and clearly it was not the case especially Vicario yeah the whole point the, the whole thing is that Tottenham how they play and I will get to Tottenham it's it, they need a goalkeeper who has to be good at the penalty area and to command it because that set piece like the amount of goals they're conceding with set pieces is insane yeah let's go yeah. to Tottenham okay. yes, so who who was the standout player for Tottenham I mean if there was any uh I think for me it was Kulusevski. Kulusevski played really well. He had Tommy on the burners. I think Tommy also had like a really poor game, especially the first half. Second half he kind of stabilized a little bit, but first half everything was going through their right, our left, and he was a little bit sloppy. Maybe because of his role, a free flowing role where he could just show up anywhere and he'd be fine. But other than that, Kulusevski or maybe Kulusevski himself, like who was your Tottenham standout player? Because they did come back to right. They were very close to just making it level on the day. No, but they did come back in the sense that I think both of them were mistakes. I mean, it's not. something that they've kind of created or enforced from there i think the first one was a raya mistake and second one was like a penalty out of nowhere i mean yeah i think there was some pressure and i think but that pressure was more self inflicted in in a way like individual mistakes i don't think tottenham performed as well as i mean normally they are good as a team like i think they can kind of build up and all of that i think they were actually good in the first half in in some ways in some phases where i think as a party was kind of taking too much time on the ball i think they created some quick transitions and all that but i don't i mean i they were always held at an arm's length to be honest i think kulusevski maybe that guy was going to be a bit okay but i don't see anyone kind of stand out in tottenham's performances to be honest i think it's basically the pressure that was in the second half is maybe because if it's in their stadium and because it's the nerves kicking in but tottenham were kind of average and i think it basically showed where arsenal are and where tottenham are and even with all the rest that they've got and and arsenal is supposed to be like you know but like you know exhausted or whatever i think but the class just showed i think it was one of those games for me i remember in the past 3 seasons whenever we went against city we were always close mm-hmm. uh, we were always playing well but they had like you know either a red we got a red card or they scored like a last minute winner or it was like like you know they didn't deserve the result but they always got the result mm-hmm. and especially in the first half it was one of Of those games where for me Arsenal were pretty below average mm-hmm. and Tottenham were uh, you know we were letting them come at us and had like a mid to low block mm-hmm. but that was fine because that was tactical the problem was we weren't able to get out of it right we were making a lot of sloppy passes we were making a lot of uh, you know misplaced passes and that kind of led them to attack us a bit more mm-hmm. but were you disappointed by ange's tactics or personnel or anything like that nirav do you think they could have done better or do you think it was just arsenal's or leader's masterclass on tactical decisions i think they set up pretty well like they were on it the crowd really supported them kulusevski as you said had a really good game he was on it again richarlison i thought was really good uh, at like when he came on but then again the weak parts of ange postcoglu system are so weak right now because of the personnel that it's easy for teams to pick that i mean the team strategies get like like narrowed down they're like okay we have yeah. to do this and we keep doing this keep doing this at some point of time we're going to succeed unless and until spurs score you know 3 4 goals or 2 3 goals in the first 30 minutes it's always going to end badly for this type of a game i feel like he needs new personnel better uh, you know he needs some more time i think i'm actually not a big fan of this sort of like a view but um this are like tactics but still like i feel like uh, he needs more time just like arteta got just like every other manager got to see more of like how this style of play can actually end up winning a lot of football matches they did win football matches but i feel like big matches when it comes to the champions league or, or you know title winning games or something like that top even top four battle games of high intensity i don't think yeah. tottenham are that equipped right now to do it that way and the fact that he does not have a plan b is is interesting as like i would say that yeah. like i uh, yeah. 
There are some yeah. places, some times, some occasions that you have to just like Arsenal, right? There, there are different tools to the team. We saw mm-hmm. today that it was playing like Mourinho side, but it worked out, <laughs> right? We didn't have to do yeah. anything. And against Chelsea, we did everything that we always do, like possession based attacking. And today we didn't have to do that. So I don't think that Spurs have done. Spurs have just played yeah. one way, slowly and steadily figuring that out. They they're getting to know that this team does not have any other you know tools. So we are just gonna. We everyone knows what to do. There's a blueprint of facing and that's not a yeah. good thing right and, now. And, and Arsenal but, have those tools because again I think it's the same team for the past like 3-4 years I mean, same manager and set up and everything that I think it'll take some time it'll definitely take some time for Postic Ange to kind of come to terms with what Tottenham can do or cannot do and then kind of develop a blueprint of sorts to see like you know to have alternative approaches to the game and I think this season they're on par with their performances I don't think they'll be too disappointed to be honest because with the new manager and everything we can judge him properly next season if they've developed that maturity or not and see yeah. where they I think I think they are on the right path. I think they have a good setup. The stadium is nice. The good revenues. They don't have a lot of FFP issues. I think. I mean, if I were a Tottenham fan, I would be sad today, but I'd be optimistic about the future in terms of like you know what's going on. Okay, let's move on to the probably the champions four time four peat. Mm-hmm. They won two 0 Haaland is Why, back. You don't want to pull. We'll, 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 we'll come to pool. We'll come to pool. We'll come to pool. But uh, we have to dis- discuss the slotting machine that's going to play out at the at the Anfield. So slotting we'll machine. Play. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> but uh, but but before that, I want to ask you this way, right? Okay, City won, Nottingham Forest. Probably some people thought it'd be a banana skin given, you know, they have the us against them mentality right now, Nottingham Forest, but didn't turn out to be that way. They played well. So game was fine, City won. Uh, but I want to ask you, given their winger situation, right? We saw Jack Grealish, Doku. Doku was a place this halftime. Jack Grealish didn't have a great game. They brought in Oscar Bob and Bernardo Silva were playing on the wings. So clearly they lacked someone to make a difference. And in comes Cole Palmer. Make a case for why Guardiola let Palmer leave. Neerof. Case for that, I mean, you can't have every player in the world right in your team. At some point in time, you'll have to let a good players leave. It happens all the time. He let Jesus, Zinchenko, Sterling. Cole Palmer, let's be real, he wasn't really starting for City. He was not going to be a starter. That was mm-hmm. not happening. Yeah. It was not, It was just not going to happen. It still won't happen. Even if even if we now know that he's a very talented, good player. But still, I don't think he's... Do you think uh, he won't... I mean, he won't, do you think he won't... He wouldn't have started? I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty, but Doku hasn't had a great season. Grealish has been basically out of the team or injured. And they don't really have another winger, out and out winger if I look at their team sheet. See, I'll, I'll tell you this though, right? One thing Guardiola doesn't do is rush players. If you've yeah. seen how he has done, you know, he has kind of developed Foden, for example, over the... Prime example. Yeah, there is every reason why maybe Foden came in, burst into the scene like what, three years ago maybe? And he hasn't played a good amount of matches in the last couple of years and there were all these pundits and everyone saying that Guardiola is hampering his development, he's doing all of this and, you know, Foden's kind of is supposed to be the next person, local guy, all of that. But he didn't listen to any of them. He just kind of did his part and you see where Foden is right now, right? I think that's basically, that's the patience what, you know, he doesn't differentiate, right? And I think, and again, I think Guardiola himself admitted that in one of these interviews is that he wanted Cole Palmer to stay. He really wanted him to develop more and I think to kind of understand his methods more and all of that. But that guy, I don't know what his associations are with the club and everything. Maybe he had better options in a, in a, in a, in a different club. And maybe right now, he's shining so much because of the dysfunction that is there at the Chelsea. He's, he's a yeah. good talent, absolutely. I'm not saying no. But say if he had gone to a different club or if Chelsea were more structural, more structured and everything, he wouldn't have been in the spotlight so much. Like maybe his goals would have been shared by other strikers or other people and everything. It's it's just, I don't, yeah, I mean, I, I as I said, hindsight is twenty twenty. I get that. But I think right now there is no way to say that Palmer would have, you know, added more to this team. There's a reason why Guardiola didn't play him. He wanted him to develop more. And I think it would have taken a couple of years for him, definitely. And I understand why Palmer wanted to move, but that's it. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, to be honest, I remember doing a pod mm-hmm. and we discussed whether Cole Palmer was overrated or underrated. Yeah. And obviously by my reaction, you could tell what I chose. I saw, I thought that he was overrated, like 40 million for a player who hasn't played anything. Right, right. Uh, but then look at him now. He's all, he's at the top of the ch- goal scoring charts. Maybe now Haaland took over because he yeah. scored today. But uh, he's right up there and he's definitely young player of the year, for me at least. I don't see anybody else coming close to him or even making a dent. But I do agree too. I mean, you make an interesting point about like Chelsea not being... Uh, as structured, right? Uh, that kinds of flows into the fact that the teams playing against them, they think that they have a chance. Mm-hmm. So they leave spaces open. They leave, uh, you know, the Chelsea to play and come at them. And that kind of adds into the fact that he's, he's scoring. He's on a great scoring run. 
Yeah, yeah, so, he's he's overperforming this season for sure. Let's see where what his consistency is. With because I'm I'm hundred percent sure there'll be a new manager at Chelsea next season, and let's see like how. He, oh wow! Yeah, no positive for you. Uh, no man, I think it, Pochettino is done. I think it, there is no way he's going to continue with this kind of football and everything. So yeah, okay, we'll see. We'll see next season. To be honest, I mean, I, I have zero sympathies for a club like Chelsea, right? Like they should get relegated. So not going to play devil's advocate here. Although this pod would seem otherwise, given the topics that we are lined up next. But I do feel Pochettino has not done a bad job like he's a he's not a title winning manager so obviously he lost the final and all of those things were you know reflecting bad on his cv but i think he's steadied the ship in a decent enough way if they had just converted their chances they would have been better at least I, the I, underlying metrics stay, says that right I, I think the answer is right there what you said right if he's not a title winning manager do you think chelsea want him like if, 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 if you're not yeah. competing for a title if you're like eighth and ninth and tenth if you, okay, yeah. I understand if Pochettino at least was like at fourth or fifth and with Spurs and Villa and everything, if he's competing, I get that. But you see some of their performances. You see the recent performance against Arsenal. How can you make yeah. players for him, right? No, there's no way. I mean, I was just going to say that the underlying metrics are all pretty decent. Like they would be fifth, sixth for them. Yeah. So there's a big finishing issue there. Plus also the squad is constructed in a way wherein like, you know, last season, at the end of last season, there was a lot of talk and chatter about their squad being bloating and you can't just manage those many players. Mm -hmm. I think it's the same right now. They have like 10 wingers and you can only play two so you have like seven central midfielders and you can only play one or two right. so like how do you manage all of those things plus the injuries so yeah i think it's a bit harsh to sack him but i do see a point of why would anybody sack him like it's it's one of those things like i wouldn't begrudge them for doing one way or the other he hasn't brought has structure to the team what's that yeah. about i'm saying this has been a hard digress <laughs> no like okay let's go back let's let's reel back okay um Palmer, yeah, right. Palmer, yeah, no. We're talking you know, about Palmer. Right? <laughs> Palmer, I feel like revels in a team which is, you know, a chaotic team where, yeah. um, where it's more of a transitional sort of system where, like, uh, he can be the focal point. This sort of like zonal Guardiola based, you know, possession based thing. He doesn't have the discipline for that. Maybe that's the reason. Maybe that is why. Maybe that's why we've seen him excel. Maybe Guardiola knew that in my system he's not going to be that great. In my system, Foden, these kind of people who can hold the width, who can be more disciplined the other type of players who can play but this guy can't maybe he's like great Guardiola has let many great players leave it's not yeah. this, he's not the first one and sometimes it's just a matter of how many good players you have in your team and you know you have to trust them and you have to let people go I don't think he wanted a lot of players to leave but some at some point in time you have to let players go if Foden co comes in sometime you know next um uh, next season if he's not playing enough and he comes in I think Guardiola let him Guardiola is very secure in his own yeah. work He's not yeah, yeah. an insecure manager. So, yeah. yeah. I think That's... two players he definitely wanted gone were Jesus and Zinchenko. And we just had the bad end of the bargain. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> they, they've been pretty good for us. I was just like, okay. So, while on City, one last thing. Bulls at home, Fulham away, Tottenham away, and West Ham at home. Don't do this and... to yourself. Do not do this to yourself. They are not slipping. I need banana skins. I need some hope. I the need only, some hope. The only hope one banana is. skin is Spurs, and that is more of a. And, and you know the history there. I think, with I think that's not a banana skin at all. Yeah, I think exactly. that's. A... And what else do you have? Wolves at home, like three zero minimum. Wolves at home and Fulham away. Maybe I don't know. I think if the they create is, chances. The problem is. I'll tell you what the problem is and what it's kind of good for us too. So we have Bournemouth and Everton. United. And by the time we reach Everton, they won't have anything to play for because they're already safe. Bournemouth have nothing to play for. They're safe. Man United have something small amount, something to play for. Doesn't matter. Tot I think with Man United, it's, it's us against us. If we can beat us, we'll beat them. <laughs> No, I mean, it's Old Trafford. Don't ever discount Old that's Trafford. Why, that's why. It's, it's mostly Arsenal against Arsenal. Like we just... We just need to play there properly, we'll win. Are, but wait, but it, continue your chain of thought. On, on, on United, just one thing. Are they safe from Conference League? Are <laughs> conference league? Do they want to end up in Conference League? I don't think anybody wants to end up in Conference League. Yeah, yeah I mean, at least for club of United stage here, right? I don't know. Like, if yeah. There is a reason why they want to play and then just get out of at least 6th or 7th or something just to kind of not end up in Conference League. They have something to play for. But otherwise, I think their season's done too. So basically, to Nirav's point, I think Bournemouth, they were and Man United, all their seasons are done. Like, there is nothing to play for for them, to be honest, except the rivalry and hate and all that. Yeah. With, you know, so Nero, where will City lose points then? Or are you saying they're not going to lose points? They're not going to lose points. That's what I'm saying. Oh my God. Nobody is optimistic, man. So it's going to be a four-peat and we're all going to be depressed. The only uh, thing that can actually happen is that, you know, City, just like you said, but it's very unlikely that a Guardiola team uh, 
you know, hits themselves with a hammer. It just never happens. So the only thing that can happen, maybe they have like a minor collapse in, uh, against Tottenham. Tottenham have something to play for. I don't think even Tottenham have anything to play for. It's just, it's, um, it's complicated, man. Like they, the fixtures they have, nothing gives me confidence here. Yeah. Like Nottingham Forest today were good. So I wish they had like a Burnley or like, a, I don't know. Everton maybe at Goodison would have been good. A Luton Town at Luton Town would have been good. You know, United Liverpool obviously would have been great, but that, that's I mean that's wishful thinking. Chelsea also would have been fine, but I, I don't know, man. Nothing gives me confidence except for Tottenham, and I know for a fact at that point in time Tottenham will have nothing to play for. So all we can do here, bro, is we win against Bournemouth. We beat Man United. It's very very important to beat Man United because the narrative will be insane. Man United, yeah. yeah. We need to control the narrative. Let's be. Let's accept the fact that we probably might not be able to win the league, but at least we'll win some hearts. That's what we want. Yeah. Do right? not let <laughs> United not... fans have the last laugh saying that yeah. they can have stopped both Liverpool and. No. There is no way United fans can have the last laugh. Even if they beat us, they'll end up sticking with Eric Ten Hag. So they, no at, this, at this point of time, they're shameless. They're, they're nothing. <laughs> they laugh at everything. I'm telling you, there is okay. <laughs> It's 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 like you're you're already completely submerged anyway. There is nothing for you to kind of think that oh no we are already here no nothing they will just kind of laugh at the misery of other people at this point of time. That is basically stopping Liverpool from winning the league at from Old Trafford. They already did that. I'll rule that every day. And if they stop, if even though you're technically not in the title, you're not done. But if they stop you from if they beat you at Old Trafford again, that's one more thing. We stop both Arsenal and Liverpool at Old Trafford. Okay, let's make yeah. a case for United. Controlling the narrative is important here because we had a really good season. Arsenal had a really good season. I would say even if City wins the league, Arsenal probably the best team in the league. Offensively the best, offensively the best. But City just performed all through like the whole season. They just got it. They have a a knack of the robotic knack of just getting points. They're a point winner team. It's like almost like a computer. They have game changers though. Like they have clutch players who... So yeah. just need one moment and then they'll win the game. I mean, they'll score and they'll do something and then it'll all be, you know, The settled. narrative is going to be dirty around Arsenal this year. That Arteta, you know, even though so much is happening, so many things happened, but really nothing happened. They didn't win anything. Yeah. That's good. We have to control that. And the only way to control that is beating, winning our next three games. If we win our next three games and City win their next four games, it's simple. It's just that they are a great team. It's nothing bad about us. We're going to finish two points behind. Last year, we finished five points behind and Liverpool have done the same. It's fine. Yeah. We call club teams amazing. It's not like we yeah. call them bottlers. We never call the club teams bottlers, right? Would you call yeah. the 97, whatever, the 97 point team okay. bottlers? No. You wouldn't call any team bottlers. Klopp has always been a bottle job. <laughs> There is no, no way you're going to get any reaction that. from me for that statement. I am in that Zen mode right now with Klopp. I'm no, one thing for sure. No, no. I mean, even I don't believe it. Even I don't believe it. I just said it. For, no, one like, thing. You know, some feathers. Dude, we, we know one thing for sure. Chelsea are not managed well. Like the ownership they have are still learning how to own a football club. Manchester United just got into a new good ownership. But they will take a lot of time to flush out whatever shit they already have in-house. Man City have Pep Guardiola, right? Right now, but after winning this league as well, I don't know where their motivations lie. What what is going to happen next season? I feel like now finally there could be no motivation or less motivation. Pep Guardiola oh. himself, we never know what he does next season. Uh, probably yeah. his last season as well. Liverpool transition, complete transition, and Tottenham will always Tottenham. So I know one thing for sure that next year, next to next year, at least the next three years, Arsenal are going to challenge at like a really really strong good level. We're going to buy again. The owners are going to give put in more money. We're going to buy star players this time not even like their diamonds we're going to buy straight up star players like Declan Rice we're going to have a couple of those signings ultimately out of this Arteta era what we need is we need one Premier League and one Champions League that's all we need <laughs> We need one, so we one need champ- two. We need, we, have- we need two of either no. one. We nope. need two of either one. That's all we need. No, we need one Premier League. We have to win the Premier League and we have to win the Champions League. That's it. We win <laughs> both these competitions. Even once, doesn't matter. It's successful, ultimately. Fair. I mean, it's still, Klopp, it's already yeah. successful. But if yes, someone says but... Klopp's reign is not successful, they're just crying, ultimately. Yeah, right? Yeah. They're saying that, like, okay, whatever. Like, he just won one Premier League, one Champions League, whatever. But he ended up celebrating every trophy that he... Except for yeah. Europa League, he celebrated every trophy. That's it. That's what matters. It's successful, so, nonetheless. They're winners. So, on this point of Europa League and the fact that two clubs have new ownership, who do you think Europa League or needs Europa League more? United or Chelsea? Given their whole situation, dynamic, club building process, everything. Need 
Uh, I... It's just three points between them. So, and Chelsea have easy fixtures. United have Arsenal. So, anything can happen. They have a better United goal defense. United have easy fixtures apart from Arsenal. There, it's, it's there. Yeah. It's I did this calculation and I see no reason, no way how Chelsea is going to finish above United. Chelsea yeah, right now they is could, if they, Wait, wait. They have like six, they're six Chelsea. points behind, and, but they're only like one game behind. Like, okay, they have played one game less. So they have Chelsea one have game Spurs, less. Chelsea have Spurs and Brighton. Oh, screw Brighton, man. What Brighton is not the team, man. Yeah. <laughs> they have Nottingham Forest away, which is going to be probably their hardest fixture because mm-hmm. of, of the con involved and you know today Nottingham Forest was so well I think that game they'll turn up even more so Tottenham and Nottingham Forest is not easy by any stretch West Ham also I wouldn't put it past Chelsea I mean I don't think it's a guaranteed Chelsea win so the only place that I can see them get six points is Brighton and Chelsea but if you go to Man United I can see them get jammy three points against Crystal Palace next week and I can no, see them beat Crystal, beating... Crystal Palace is not an easy team right now. I know. But I'm, I'm, they're going to get that jammy three points. Crystal Palace are just transitioning into a ball playing possession based team. And they're going to make mistakes. They're going to commit mistakes. I and the United, they're going to play in United's hand, basically, of how they play. And that's where I think they're going to get three. Brighton also, I'm going to think they're going to get three. So I feel like United will finish above. But who uh, needs Chelsea. it more? Who needs it more? And United needed more. You think uh, so? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if they need it more, need but more. I... for the pod. I mean, need, more need, 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 need as in yeah, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I would love to force the other two guys watch conference. I wish they finish in the yeah. Champions League. On that, the exactly. No, I yes. just want them to be in the Conference League and then just yeah, suffer just through really it. Right? Want them to be in the Conference just, League. Just and, to mean, yeah. and Chelsea would need Europa League just so that all of their squad can play at least one game each every now and then. So all of their like 20, 30 people, whatever they have in this squad. But yeah, I think Chelsea United in the Conference League, hopefully. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. I think yeah. for me, I think Chelsea needs it more because United, I don't know, they can still anything in Champions League is kind of like a failure for them. But for if they get Europa League, I think it gives them real wings to add the project mm-hmm. and bring the fan base back on at least on the surface yeah. or like just below the surface. You know, I think that club is so dull right now. And I love it. Long made continue. Yeah, honestly, Chelsea can do with the season with nothing also. They can do with the yeah, season with yeah. nothing. Because anyway, they have like a lot of... I feel like United getting into this new ownership, getting probably getting a new manager, hopefully for them. They're going to want more fixtures. They're going to want... The new manager would want Europa League to, you know, try out the youngsters. They have to yeah. try a lot of things out next season. They have to be on like trial and error sort of like a season. <laughs> and this is where they have to... They need more games. They need more inconsequential games. Yeah. I think another factor is FFP. I think from an FFP standpoint, both the clubs are kind of like in a turmoil. United are in a United pretty are bad not, United, United are never, good. Ever, they're they're ever right. been, everything. They're good. They are good. It, it is. It is. But they still haven't been able to buy a player. Like, you remember last January, they got hmm. Weghorst on loan. This time, so the they reason, got... The whole reason for that was because of the ownership. The ownership was in like a limbo and mm-hmm. they didn't want to commit money. They didn't want to commit things. Anyway, United oh, was in okay. debt at that point. Now, yeah. Ratliff coming in, you know, he has his, he is using the revenue to actually, he will generate money and he will give a war chest to United. Yes. Now, they, now they have a clear ownership. They have an investors coming in. So it's now it's going to be clear. Now they're going to buy players. The only good thing they can do right now for their club is get a good manager. And yeah. that will put United somewhere above, up there. Because they have good background staff now. They have really good directors up front. They have every, everything has changed at that club. Yeah. So if a good manager, a, a really smart, you know, like a Klopp, a guy who can connect the fan base to the team mm-hmm. is there and connect the whole structure to the team up to down, that kind of like a presence is needing. That kind of, cause, which Ten Hag is not. He's not yeah, that. Ten Hag is nothing. Like, and I okay. think to chill would be perfect that. But Before moving on to Chelsea, I just want one topic. My favorite topic. I think two of my favorite players from these respective clubs. They're star strikers. Signed in January. One for 72 million. One for 36. Nico Jackson versus Hoyland. Who is having a better season? Not talking about potential. Not talking about the future. Just who's had a better season. Or have they been both flops? Both hits? Or both like whatever. Any opinion? I think Holland is marginally better compared to Nicholas Jackson. I think maybe it's recency bias. Maybe it's all those the misses against 
against City and, and all that's happening with against Arsenal and everything. Maybe that's kind of playing in my head right now. But I've never seen a striker so dysfunctional in front of goal like Nicol- Nicholas Jackson. And I see Nunes every day. So I, I, I don't understand where the hesitation comes from, where the reluctance to shoot comes from. And it, it's something which kind of blows my mind. Like, And the worst part is he gets into those positions. He makes those runs. He yeah. tries. He gets into the position. And then after that point, it's done. The brain capacity is gone. You don't know what to do with the football. You don't know where the goal is. You don't know who's behind you, ahead of you. You don't know. You don't even have the strength to pass the ball. That one chance he had against City in the FA Cup semi-final, right? I think he went through and he could have chipped the goalkeeper. He didn't do that. Fine. He kind of yeah. went sideways to the goalkeeper and he fucked it up. And then the last option for him was to play a normal, simple pass to people who are kind of coming behind him. And he couldn't do that properly as well. And I think, again, this is this is where these, these are the things you cannot coach. Like these are these are the things which you have to have them inherently right. And that's where I think, I mean, because you can make that, you can tell the striker to make those runs. You can tell them to kind of, you know, you know uh, work with your midfielders and kind of have this, have their connection and everything. But these things are something which you have to develop by yourself. And I think Nicholas Jackson doesn't have any of them. And coming to ho- Holland, I think he's not getting enough service with all the dysfunction that's happening within that team. Maybe with better service because I've seen him. I think he had a patch of like six goals in six consecutive games or something like that. At least he, he showed that he has some potential. Like he can, you know, do whatever he wants. At least like as long as there is service and it, people are kind of... And again, he, he obviously is not a hit. He's not been a, signing, a good signing. But at first season, maybe with the signs he has shown, maybe one more season, I think we can give him and then judge him. But Jackson has been a complete calamity, man. Okay, I, that's... I don't agree to it, but Nirav, go ahead. Your opinion on the two. I mean, if you see the stats, Jackson has done marginally better than, actually better than Hoyland. But I feel like players who perform in Europe are actually good players. So I feel like Hoyland has performed in Europe. He scored goals and in the Champions League, he has that, he is more of like, he gives me more hope like for him in the future Jackson again like Jackson is like he we already have labeled him as a bozo so I can't yeah. see past that anymore I can't see past the fact that he's like he's just a bozo who's gonna miss chances so kind of like a yeah. burner kind of like s feeling that he gives um also I'm that gonna... that penalty farce right the whole thing that happened oh, really? with Palmer yeah. Yeah, yeah. it off that tells me that this guy is not mature enough right now to to be a player for such a big club and Hoyland I think has that head over him so that's why Hoyland will probably if you had to put your money Hoyland probably going to have a better career I think I don't disagree with any of you I think both to be honest for me both of them are in the same boat either they are okay signings or they are flops none of them is one above the other but I just want to make a case for Nico Jackson wherein like I think he's he's basically coming from he was a no-name before signing for Chelsea right he was good striker playing second fiddle in Villarreal for six months and he came on a uh, decent price enough like 32 36 million is not that that much for a striker in today's world he's still young and his holder play and running with the ball is pretty legit like I remember Arsenal versus Chelsea the only time I've seen someone running past Saliba was him doing it in like in the first half and Saliba just couldn't deal with it and his cutback kind of hit Gabriel and hit the post and then went out so I think he a lot of Chelsea's play a lot of Chelsea's goal a lot of positioning that Cole Palmer gets is because of his build-up play and his connection between the different zones of the team and that is something that's going for him he does not have a trademark finish and he is a bozo for sure if he can develop his finishing maybe like you know just, just practice one sort of finishing, like Henri did. Henri had like one finish and he practiced that. He was dead and then he perfected it. So maybe if he can do that, yeah, sure. But I think he's not a total disaster at Chelsea. He's been, he's been whatever, but he's not like a total disaster. I mean, I have a little bit of hope from him. So that's my defense for Jackson. Although I never would want to defend Jackson. But, but anyway, how's Liverpool doing, bro? Uh, Liverpool are in a zen. Ready, ready to gamble on the slot machine? Like, how's it going? Another baldy in the league? What, what about it? Yes, we we want to join the ball revolution as well. I think it's, it's basically right now, it's not working out at this point, uh, given everything, you know, especially in the last couple of years with, you know, with Klopp taking a more of a say in transfers and everything. I've seen kind of how that had an adverse impact on the team and, you know, we can get to in, get into it later. But I think it's, it's a calculated gamble with respect to how the management and the head coach position is I think I've read somewhere that he's not going to be the manager but his designation is actually is a head coach and he'll be reporting to director of football and then he'll be reporting to Michael Edwards and everything which I think is the best solution considering everything that's happening around the club right now because there are a lot of reasons why we find ourselves in this stage and you know and one or more of the reasons has to be with with Klopp having more of a say in transfers and in the overall management of the club after the backroom stuff walked out in the season. Now 
now they are trying to kind of divide responsibilities more and then make sure that everyone can do their job perfectly. And that's basically what is the reason behind it. And I think Arne Slot has kind of proved himself working on a good budget and making sure that he, he can develop players and his teams are also not like perennially injured. Like they don't have all of these injuries coming coming up every now and then. So I think he's proved himself with respect to what FSG wants in the head coach position. I'm not saying it will work amazingly, but I'm really excited to see what kind of new shape and new formations will play and then how we'll kind of develop players because there are, there are a lot of players whose careers are kind of right now in that question mark or in that limbo zone sort of right now, because especially with Salah and you know, Van Dyke and everyone because their contracts are up, we only have one year left on the contracts. We want to see what the role is for Trent because if Trent stays, he, is, he will be the next captain sent. Yeah, we want to kind of look into all of those transitions so i think it's a good thing and probably the best thing we can ask for without club because there can never be another club we cannot have yeah so we'll see Nirav, do you think there's a there's a larger issue at play here with the lack of proper managers or when i say proper i mean like well-known managers who have won something who've been at bigger clubs and their willingness to move like i remember we did a section where we decided we kind of like you know contemplated where all these big managers can go but none of them is kind of going anywhere at this point of time so do you think honest lot were you Javi is gonna stay at clever goose and that yeah, yeah yeah you did yeah yeah. We said that I said that Tuchel is going to move to United and I still believe that that's going to happen. Depending on the FA Cup final, a lot of things, sure. if you know, by a fluke United win that final through you never, whatever, you never know. They can keep Ten Hag because then that'll be like just. But you're right, there are, apart from Tuchel, this is probably a bad season for Klopp to to leave. Could have possibly stayed one more season and next season would have been good because a lot of managers are going to be available. But then I guess, I mean, it's a personal decision. You can't say anything about that. Yeah. But yeah, to managers in the... Yeah, there are there isn't much out there, honestly. It's a, you think it's, Ernest Ford is a, is a... It can probably a dangerous choice or a wrong choice? Wrong is a, not a wrong choice, but like... I'm not qualified here to comment on Ernest yeah. Ford because I don't watch the Dutch league. That is one league that I have not seen at all, except for like... But you I have the size of another Baldy from the Dutch league. Uh, if you have to say that, then if I had to... If I see a Dutch person who's bald in the <laughs> league, I'm probably going to... Dutch person in general in the Premier League, if Arnes Lord succeeds, he'll be the first one. I haven't seen yeah. any Dutch people succeed in the Premier League. That's not a... That's just a... That's just banter, honestly. Uh, yeah. But yeah, like l- last year, Tottenham were going all out for Arnes Lodz and he actually rejected them. So... That tells you the teams wanted him and that this guy had like this guy has a head to think where he wants to go and where he does not want to go. He saw Liverpool opportunity and he decided that this is the place I will go. And he's also the highest earning Dutch manager in the Eredivisie right now. They haven't mm-hmm. gone that high yet. So he definitely is someone who's highly rated and you cannot discount that right now. He's a tactician, he's 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 a disciplinarian, so all these things can be good for where Liverpool are right now. Yeah. Um but it'll be a change, man. It's not going to be a love story anymore. You know, yeah. Klopp is so... Um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right, Avina? Yeah, he's not like a big daddy Klopp anymore. He's like a daddy. Yeah, like yeah. Liverpool's yeah. dad is happy. It's not... He's... Arnest Orton will more be like a professional. Like a professional yeah, yeah. guy. Like he's going to work. He might win football matches, might win trophies, but he's not, never going to be your own. Exactly. Yeah. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. We can potentially be more successful with Arnest Slot. We can win more titles. Maybe if Pep leaves and, and all of that, we can win more titles. But we'll never enjoy them as much as we did with Klopp. That's a given. Yeah. I think that relationship that he has built with us and I think with the city, with mm-hmm. the fans and, you know, it, it, it's it's like a family member leaving, man. I think it, it's, yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't just kind of come to terms with it when he announced it on 26th of January. I woke up and I saw it and I'm like, I was literally in tears. And right, the day. Finish, yeah, I, that that's the day I think we started this podcast also, I think, or the week I guess. So it took me a lot of time to come to terms with it. But having come to terms with it in some ways right now, I think it actually makes sense because there is, again, we can't clone. We, there is There can never be another club. And I think given everything that's happening around the club, and I've seen how Klopp's influence also was kind of a bit waning in the last couple of years, especially last season was a disaster. This season, I think we did good. It's fine. He was taking more and more responsibilities and the team is also not as structurally set up and it's all kind of all over the place sort of and we are kind of winning big based on the influence and somewhat we're kind of looking at the results every now and then. I want more structure in the team and I think that is probably going to come with someone who has kind of proved himself in the Dutch league. And again, there are a dearth of managers, definitely, but we have to do with what we have, so... Yeah. yeah, I think I agree with the fact that, you know, there's something special with winning 
trophies with someone who's brought you from the ditches yeah. right yeah. more than the connection it's like you were nowhere in the picture mm-hmm. and then you won it with them so you kind of feel like a cycle completing and the process of fulfillment mm-hmm. as we would if our title you know if or not when exactly. our title wins first title or whatever Right, I 100% agree, right? Because I think Arteta wanted, loves Arsenal genuinely. And I think that was yeah. with Klopp as well. I think with, again, with Borussia Dortmund and the connection between Jura Wokel and all of those things, the, the kind of support and everything, he really wanted yeah. to come to Liverpool and kind of make an impact. And he kind of, right now, he loves the club, right? I think that's the case with Arteta as well. Winning anything, winning, as Nirav said, winning one Champions League or one Premier League with Arteta will mean a lot, lot more than what you can potentially win with the other managers. Again, because this is your season where you kind of, you're on that stage and saying, that okay this is what we can do this is what we will yeah. do and i think good doing that with the with person who really has your best interest at heart that kind of gives you an amazing high i think i want to talk about salah but i do want to say on arnis lord that i don't i think it's a pretty good signing i think all of these clubs like our big clubs they have to give opportunities to new people because otherwise it'll just be the same set of like 8 9 10 managers moving around mm-hmm. and failing at different different places so i think it's definitely a bold decision but it definitely has the opportunity to be a good one right uh, but will it be a good one with Salah at the in the team or not that is the question uh, I think this is that this is a crossroad situation with Salah right I think if right now if you ask me I really think we should sell Salah to be honest we should kind of get whatever money we can get for him because again only because there is Dutch league who is going to pay 100 million for him or somewhere close to that yeah. right no not Dutch league sorry Saudi league Uh, oh so, yeah only because there is someone who can actually pay that amount of money for him we can reinvest and get a new because again i'm not saying this because he's been poor over the last couple of months he's he's a legend he's a legend for liverpool and i think but the thing is he is never going to be the torch bearer for the next generation of liverpool under the new manager you don't know what the new manager is going to do with him and you saw how pissed off he was yesterday when he was benched for a couple of games and all justifiably because he was benched because the team was doing so well without him right now and you've seen how well we were against fulham without sala and nunes it it's not working i mean it's just it's not working right now and we don't want probably to kind of not to, we don't we don't want to kind of have someone on the team who was not pleased with their position and their role in general and this probably all things considered his his, atta- his attacking output is also kind of declining a bit so this is basically where we can just sell him get some good money invest again and then get a new you know front three whoever and then move forward i think if klopp's yeah. leaving i really don't mind anyone if anyone else is leaving yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I heard a lot about Arne Slot and Klopp leaving and all that. Let's why don't we just talk about Liverpool's uh, bottle? <laughs> Five points here at top. A bottle the Europa League. 3-0 against Atlanta, bottled the FA Cup, bottled the league title, lost against <laughs> Crystal Palace, drew against West Ham. It's shades of nostalgia, isn't it? A little bit. When this season started. Yes, 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 I want you to say that. I want you to, to know what's coming. Is it? Say it. Say it. I want you to say that. When, when this, this season, season started, started, the expectation <laughs> was... Expectation was top four at a trophy and we top four. five. Not even top four. Say that, bro. Yeah. You're not top, even top four. We are when top last four, right? season started, yeah, you are top four. No, this season. Last, when last season, yeah, when last season started, I'm talking about us. When last season started, all of mm-hmm. the hundreds predictions, everything was Arsenal to finish outside of top four. Right? Well, it was like we started to go bad. because he can't achieve more. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I can't achieve more. It feels bad, right? It's mm-hmm. it's crazy, man. Like how people just bring out narratives. What happens? These this bottle narrative or whatever. It's it's a it's crazy. Actually, I thought Klopp's massively over. achieved with the squad like yeah. massively just because and of his aura and his coaching his aura and his coaching and again i'll i'll tell you what if you want to call it a bottle yeah by all means go ahead i'm not not going to say we didn't right i mean because obviously look at the results against west ham i mean crystal palace crystal palace at home was a dagger man that was the result right i think everton at everton away we were th- i was thinking we maybe we'll, we'll drop some points but crystal palace at home that was so bad but the re- the way we were performing in january and february against kind of weaker oppositions with luton and all of those games at that point of time before all city and arsenal and all of these games came up i think that was not sustainable to be very honest with you i think the way we were kind of just kind of getting through and scraping through games with with younger people and all of that and i remember these conversations in the group itself like liverpool is the third best team in the league but somehow they're still kind of leading the race and all of that and they're they're, they're going to come back i mean they could they'll concede the first goal they're going to come back the thing is we fucked around and we found 
found out. That's basically what it is. Like, and we really kind of played, you know, played that part of like conceding the first goal. We were very slow to begin with. We did that against Brighton. We did that against Sheffield and all of those things, right? So it's not sustainable, the kind of football that we're playing. And now it's kind of dawning on me that, yes, I mean, we are, the place we have is where what we deserve, to be honest, with the football that we've been playing since the beginning of 24, to be honest. And the injuries didn't help. If Jota was there, I think at least they would have at least gotten at least a couple more points, maybe at least been in the conversation right now. Jota getting injured, Allison getting injured, it didn't help at all. And if if you think, if I think of it, and again, I'm super critical of Nunes right now, all of our misery right now is kind of is central. All of the pain that we are enduring right now is because of four Nunes decisions. The first one against Old Trafford at FA Cup, we were leading 3-2. He gives away a pass for no goddamn reason and Rashford goes and equalizes. The second one, he doesn't square to suppose like against at Old Trafford, it would have been 2-1, game over, done. He doesn't do that. The third one against Atlanta, first leg at Anfield, easy finish. He could have rounded the keeper. No, he doesn't do that. And the fourth one against Everton, again, one more shot, easy finish. The goal was wide open. Pickford was just squatting there he doesn't finish that and again i mean i'm, I'm just like hating on Nunes. but the point is oh, it's what really, you really keep all the bad memories close to your heart huh? i could see where the season started unraveling because if we had not gotten knocked out, knocked out of the fa cup before the break at old trafford i'm pretty sure it wouldn't have been as bad as this it's just a snowballing effect of like okay losing to fa losing a minute at old trafford that kind of spills over to the other things that happened after international break and it's just sure this, this, this sounds like not that Bro to me. I mean, the same thing happened. It's just <laughs> everything. I, I, the only thing, only difference here is, I mean, last season, it was just us and City. So we were like in the spotlight. This year, yeah. it's Arsenal, City and you guys. Imagine if Arsenal was fighting in the top four and it was just you and City. Mm-hmm. Then definitely this would be a collapse. Just because Arsenal is there, three teams are there, three title races become two now. So it's fine. It's okay. There's mm-hmm. no one's focusing on Liverpool that much. But in isolation, if you see, if it was just Liverpool and City chasing one after the other like they have been last season and this happens, mm-hmm. that would be the narrative would be different. Yeah. Same thing happened with us last season. We drew against Liverpool. We were leading 2-0 at halftime. Mm-hmm. We fucked up we drew against Liverpool. Then we drew against... Saka missed a penalty, two against West Ham. Then we lost against Southampton. Then we lost against Brighton. Over, finished. So, yeah, yeah I mean, things happen, dude. But no, I think I'm not all of that aside. And mm-hmm. knowing the fact that Klopp definitely has overachieved with the squad, I don't think Darwin Nunez should be starting for a title chasing team. I don't think that a striker nope. would ever be in a title chasing team. I think he's a good striker, but he's not <laughs> at the level right now. He, he is a be. striker who can come off the bench, keep running and make against tiring defenders and make those pass he's make those you know for that Tottenham. He's perfect. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Mr. Yeah. Tottenham. Yeah, remember I told I said that Darwin Nunes would probably be dropped if or sold if Xavi Alonso came into Liverpool. Mm-hmm. I think this was one of the reasons because if you look at Xavi Alonso, he needs a clutch finisher at top. Mm-hmm. which Nunes is not. So I think I always feared for him. But do you think Mane should have been retained? I mean, I'm going back. Oh, to the no, no. The, the airship has sailed. I think, I think basically hindsight is also makes people very nostalgic in a lot of ways. But Mane was past his best. We had to move him in that season with the quadruple chasing season. Maybe uh-huh. like those last two games, we had to move him from left wing to right into the false nine position just so that he can recover some of his pace and all of that. And he was missing chances left and right. Now we don't focus on all the chances we missed. All we are looking at is okay. Oh, Mane could have scored this goal, that goal, and all of that. But Mane was past his best, and it would have. It was a nice of all the front three, right? Firmino, Salah, and Mane at that point. The first to leave obviously would have been Mane, and he left. There is no way going back to that point. I. It's good that we've replaced him with Luis Diaz, and Diaz had his injuries and everything, so he couldn't perform to the level of Mane. But Mane couldn't have done anything. He's done. Okay, last segment. Last segment. Uh... Before that, is this segment anything about more? Can we talk about uh, Mo? I mean, he, like, I think he, he spoke about it. You Do you want to say your words on Mo? L- write his obituary. Maybe I missed it. Maybe that's no, already right. been... No, 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 so write write his obituary. I'm all in for it. No, no, just about... Not his obituary. He's a great player. I just feel like he's... I mean, just the quarrel with Klopp. I just want to know more about it. I haven't read much about it. But I just read that he sort of said something like, if I would speak, there would be fire or something like that. So, so I think is, that, there, little, is there more so to that's, enough? So that's a little out blown out of proportion because I mean to be honest, we see the video of him doing it. So he was like, you know, he was walking through the press area and people were calling, you know, more a word a word, and he was like, I personally think what he said was that if I speak anything, you guys turn it against us and that will become fire. And that's why I don't want to speak to you. And he was like, 
smiling. He was smiling. And by think, saying so, he spoke something. That's the whole. That's the whole point. The, yeah. <laughs> he was. He was not. He was, he was being very. Yeah, he was not there. pissed. I don't think he was pissed or anything. I think it was just the narrative that sells that is being printed. The quarrel I definitely do, happened. Like, I do feel like Salah has lost a lot of lost that edge. Yes, yeah, I, I, I think. Lost I think that edge. Lost that fire. He's lost that pace. He's lost. Lost. He's become unidirectional, one-dimensional, sort of like a footballer. Right now, he's really clinical for sure. He's a good goal scorer and everything, but like something about him is a miss. And I feel like Klopp realized this. Got like younger people there. Javi Elliott was playing left, right wing, I think. Javi um, Elliott, yeah, plays right wing, yeah, right wing or right midfield. Yeah. So yeah, I slightly, that's, that's... I slightly disagree. But you know why? Because I think up until he went to Afcon, he was on fire. Like he was providing assists, he was providing goals, he was leading everything for Liverpool. Then he came back. He got injured at Afcon. Hamstring went away, and then he was just not him. Mm-hmm. And I think, unfortunately for him, the move, the playing style went past him in a way wherein like it's very difficult to you know get a player back in and cater your playing style to him in a run in so he was just not available to have that continuity to maintain his skills and his output i think that's what played against him maybe he's gone down a little bit because of those injuries but i think he's still you know the same player that we had at least at the beginning of this season if not the I'll, last and i'll tell you what right i think sala has been okay the injuries has kind of kind of you know subdued him a bit and afcon going away at that point at this stage of the season that is kind of not ideal but the first first game he kind of started or he kind of was was on the bench for after afcon after coming from injury an inch perfect pass to diaz right away for him to yeah. start. He, he was doing his part it's not yeah. if Salah was off his mark or anything and these small things these margins actually matter man i think if if, if that goal was scored if we won against city or if you know all the things that he was doing for the team were being converted or being at least fruitful there is there are these videos doing rounds on twitter like what salah has created and how the team has failed him the output by not having the output and there is one specific video of sala creating so many chances for nunes only for him to kind of keep blowing them over and over and over and i'm telling you it's, it's i can understand his frustration right i mean it, it's him and nunes are not working together they they are they're not able to kind of function together and club does what he has to do like he has to bench him and sala is a source loser when he is on the bench yes. he yeah. kind of lashes out and everything and i think any player does like even henderson did that milner did that and sala is not doing it but i think right now again i think it's it's a good time for him to kind of move past all of this frustration again somewhere and then for Liverpool also also to start fresh and i think that's what i think should happen but and i think that's what will happen because right now there's no club and none of that sentiment right now it's just all michael edwards and more of this professional approach to things so we'll see yeah and edwards also has a track record of building teams by selling superstars so yeah, yeah. he doesn't uh, so i think that that definitely plays against him okay last one fire sale at newcastle who who are you guys buying i think they then they in some trouble with their Peak. Are there rumors that they might sell Bruno Gomares? They might sell Isak. Although I don't see that happening, but you never know. If a good offer comes in, there's Anthony Gordon, Harvey Barnes, who's injured. There's also their centre back, right? I forgot his name. What's his name? Centre back. Who? Fabian Schar. Botman. 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 So Botman. Botman. So they have like some pretty good players. Who are you guys buying for your clubs? You know, the I easy stack. answer for us is uh, Bruno Gimarish. But I think the 100 million release tag is a bit too much. I think there can be better options there. But I mean, this could be a good buy as well. If 100 million is not that much in the next market, which I think 100 million is probably the new 70 million or something. Yeah. So that way it's not two less and I think he could be a good replacement for Parthi for us Parthi yeah. or Zinio he could sit in the in the mid, deep lying midfield and actually play really well for us yeah. Yeah. I think he also to your point right to your point the release clause can be paid in like five years or something which plays in whoever is going to buy them or if they are selling him their favor so I think yeah. definitely for us nuts for us like he would be nice yeah. he's a player made for Arsenal he's a player made for Arteta but I just don't see it happening man yeah. why would they sell such a good player. So, I think it's just the FFP issues. I think that's nothing else that that can force their hand to sell any player that they have. I think mm-hmm. they'll it's, figure something else out. Honestly, that's what like I like. Some but, Saudi sponsorships. Yeah, airline <laughs> sponsoring them. Yeah, something yeah. will come up. I think they I would tell, love someone like. Will I tell, they will tell Bruno Gimash to Al Nasser, and then they will loan him back. That's what they'll do. Dude, that literally happened with this guy, right? Neves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The wolves, wolves, the wolves guy, right? He went, the midfielder, he went and then he was trying to come back to Newcastle or someplace, right? I don't remember his name. The midfielder who was really young. He was like 25. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ruben Neves, yeah. Ruben Neves, yeah. He went there and then Newcastle were bringing him back on loan after Tonali and I was like, dude, this is some <laughs> next level manipulation. going. On. Yeah, but 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 I think I think if, if again, if you're playing that game, Isaac would be an amazing fit for Liverpool, especially if, if with Salah leaving... 
I mean, I'm thinking he leaves. And yeah. with Nunes not firing and all of that, he'll be that perfect mold of that wide forward for Liverpool on the right or on the left. So Isaac definitely, Anthony Gordon apparently is a Steven Gerrard fan. So I don't know, maybe yeah. we'll see. I mean, my pick was Bruno Gamayesh and second one was Anthony Gordon. I think he would be fire for us, yeah. especially with Arsenal's or Arteta's ability to develop fingers. I think he would be pretty, pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Botman would be nice too, but I don't think there's any other. So I was looking at the squad. Out of the apart from these four five, they don't have like you know that name that would sell in the market, even if they are willing to you know trying to raise some funds. So I think Isak, Bruno Gomares, Gordon, and Botman for me, any of those four would be the ones. Yeah. Uh, Okay, anything. That's about it. So this was our podcast. Let us know who would you buy from Newcastle or do you think Hoyland is better than Nicholas Jackson? <laughs> or, if you think, or if you think Arsenal is going to win the league? I think, uh, let's not talk about that. Let's not jinx it. Nobody does that, please. I, I, have, think, I think with all the... I think Arsenal have had good amount of luck this season in general with injuries and with the squad and everything. And I think if some of that luck plays into the next three, four games, maybe you'll have an outside chance of winning the league. I mean, you're not... Just need City to drop points, right? I mean, just don't... <laughs> Need it, one draw. We don't have to lose. Right? All we need is one draw. I think draw. we're not losing. Wait, the goal difference is good. For this 20 years, bro. We will make goal differences through the roof. There's nobody catching okay, a goal difference. City got some of the difference back and with, uh, with no, the City. No, no, with no, no. The other what we smashed Chelsea. 5-0. I know, I know, but okay, it's plus seven. Oh yeah, plus seven draw. is very hard to. Yeah, right now it's only like five look, games. Look, right? If we win the next three games, that's the only criteria that we might even have a chance. Mm-hmm. Uh, we will probably get plus three, minimum plus three will. Minimum get, plus right? three, yeah. And okay. that'll be sixty for us, and they will need to in the last four games get plus ten. Possible, very possible. But that's what uh, I'm saying. I don't think. That's... I, no, I don't then, think we're going to beat beat Bournemouth and Everton 1-0. I think just last by one year, yeah, exactly. Yeah. By the way, last year, Everton faced us on the last day after we bottled the league and they were already safe. Probably the same thing is going to happen this year it's and we beat them 5-0. We beat them. So, I, can, I can see plus 3, I can see plus 6 there for sure. In those two, United, I don't know. Maybe plus 1. So I can see a plus 6 for Arsenal mm-hmm. and getting 14 in 10 games, in 4 games for City with Tottenham there, I doubt it. With the, also the pressure, right? Of pressure of just if winning the game. It, if they yeah, and they're going to draw one game. That's the assumption we're taking, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, so that yeah. means that 3, so one game three games zero, they'll yeah. have to get. Three games, they have to get minimum 10. And if they do it, then they deserve the league. Fuck it. Like, what do we even do there? <laughs> no, no. All, all, all I'm it, saying is... It. No, all I'm saying, I think there is... There can be, again, this is very offhand. I mean, I, I don't have any basis for it. So, maybe against... Again, I don't like know. I said, bro, like I said, win all of our games. Win against Bournemouth. Win against Everton. And beat Man United at Old Trafford. That's it. Fuck it. Whatever happens, yeah. happens. It's not in your hands anymore. Just win, yeah. win. Three Ws and we see what happens. Yeah.